All right, everybody. Today we're going to talk more about World War II. Uh, one of the important things uh, that we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about the Holocaust. Uh, it is necessary to talk about the Holocaust. It is one of the most famous events that happened in the history of the world. Uh, there is some different ways of viewing it that, that are important and why the horrificness of it is so awful. Now you're like, Mr. Wagstaff, wasn't like millions of people killed in it? Yes. There were, by estimates, about 13 million people that were killed in the Holocaust. Uh, Six million of those were Jewish people. The other uh, uh, seven million, and it's a guesstimate, which is horrible that they have to guesstimate by millions, uh, were people that Hitler just didn't like for whatever reason. So the largest individual group were Jewish people. Uh, and you're like, that isn't bad enough. We can't just be like, it's bad and move on. Uh, well, you can if you internalize how awful that is. The thing about it, though, is the fact that it happened in a modern democracy, all right? That this happened in a country where these people are smart, they're intelligent, they're not, you know, what we would classify as a third world country who doesn't know what's going on and they're fighting for survival, so these horrible things happen, uh, or shouldn't happen, and it happened in a completely modern country like America. So what I want to do here at the start of today is show you uh, how that can happen, um, and it's kind of crazy because a lot of it is with Hitler. Hitler is an absolutely captivating leader of Germany. People loved Hitler. And you're like, okay, we're talking about the Holocaust now. So Hitler aggressively tried to keep the Holocaust a secret. I, I know it sounds weird. Let, let me ju just ex explain to you, uh, here with some pictures of what I got. So I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures here of, of Hitler's political rallies. Uh, I want you to see these massive crowds of people, all right, that exist. Let me minimize myself. So these are crowds of people. This is when, this is in the 1920s before Hitler even becomes in charge. So these crowds of people show up to hear a political speech. Yes, a lot of these formation here are a lot of times his, uh, his brown shirts, as he calls them. Uh, we'll call that what they were called. Mussolini had the black shirts. He had his brown shirts. These were, uh, uh, and these uh, more elite would be the SS so his brown shirts are basically his army. So a lot of times in the front, you're going to see it when they're in formation. Uh, so, but uh, the people in the stands would show up for a political speech. Now, as I show you these pictures, they get bigger and bigger and bigger as he gets more and more popular in Germany. Understand that people aren't showing up because they're required to. This is not a concert. There's not free food. They're not giving away anything. These are people traveling from all over the country in order to see a political speech. So as these crowds get bigger, understand people are coming on their own because they love this man, because he promised he would fix things, and it appears like he is. Also keep in mind, when you're like, okay, the Holocaust though, what, did you just say that people didn't know about it? He never talked about it. There's actually not a single piece of paperwork in existence, present day, in 2020, because it doesn't exist, of that connects Hitler to the Holocaust. Let that blow your mind. Hitler knew smart enough that when he told people to do stuff, he did it in person, voice to voice. When he says, go murder all them, he doesn't let it be written down. He was smart enough then to know, don't let a paper trail. Hitler is a complete dictator of, of Nazi Germany. This entire massive thing, which actually hurts their war effort to take all their resources to go murder a group of people, drastically takes away from his ability to, to win the war, uh, doesn't happen without his approval, say so, and his initiative. But so even present day, we can't fundamentally connect him. I mean, obviously he did it. Uh, I mean, he's not, it'd be 0% chance he could possibly have not known the entirety of what was happening. It was all his idea. But so he, he was smart enough then not to really create a paper trail to, uh, to himself. And another important thing to understand, FDR, the American president, is in a wheelchair. Most Americans at the time, during the 1930s, don't know. You know why? Because they didn't want to know. Nobody wants to view their leader as weak or wrong. They just turned a blind eye. Anybody started talking trash about Hitler, they just ignored it. Like, nope, nope, that's my boy. He's only doing good stuff, putting us to work, helping our economy. Nope. I don't know why you would say these crazy things about him. Uh, so I understand that that he was absolutely loved in Germany, at least up until the start of World War II. And uh, while things were going well, he was absolutely loved in Germany. And most people turned a blind eye to any possibility that he could actually be a complete psycho. So here's another picture. This is one after he becomes chancellor. Uh, this is about the time he takes over and becomes the president as well. 
This is another photograph from the same uh, uh, rally that he has from a different angle. This is another one. This is a sea of people on, on, on the sides uh, as he comes out here. And th they're like dead silent to hear uh, him give a political speech. I got a video clip of here of him giving a political speech. Uh, it has English subtitles at the bottom. Understand that his speeches, it's all about nationalism. It's like, like give back to Germany. It's usually a relatively positive message. He's not like murder everybody. It's a lot of times it's you're better than everybody. Don't let somebody else hold you down. Do it for Germany. We're superior. These are the things he says people like a positive message is what he would constantly tell them. So here's a video clip of Hitler actually giving a speech. And play. Here, here's another one of his rallies. Now, now, keep in mind, I mean, people came from all over to, to hear him speak, and he continuously gets more popular because he says, I want to fix it, and he ends up fixing it. While he, there might be some weird stuff that, like, seems odd that should really sit off a flag that this dude is, like, broken inside. When he's doing good things for the uh, society that, you know, that, is in, that he's in Germany, uh, they're very supportive of him. Uh, so I'll, I, we're going to get there and we're going to talk about the Holocaust in particular here. Uh, so the, the point of this is to show how much support this man had loved, this country loved him, all right? While he is already starting the beginnings of the Holocaust, uh, of the, this extermination of a race of people. So these two things are happening at the same time. And, it, and it's terrifying. This happened in a modern democracy. Uh, we can see the sea of people out here. There's another massive rally. You can see the sea of people out here that, that have shown up. Obviously this here and, and over here, the, this is military that's like required to be there. But these groups here are massive populations of people. This is a, uh, the pictures are very good. I got a couple more pictures of this rally. Uh, but that's Hitler walking up to give a speech. This is a whole nother rally. Just hordes of people uh, that have shown up for these rallies. And it says 160,000 Germans stand in silence as Hitler, Himmler, and Lutz walk to a ceremonial pathway toward a giant wreath honoring Germans killed in battle. So this is during World War II. This, I mean, it's a color photo, so it excites people a little bit more. Uh, this massive amount of people over here. Again, these guys are showing up for a political speech, all right? Uh, because they liked their leader so much. This is only half the picture. Here's the other half. Look at it's just a sea of people to the horizon. I mean, it, it's it's hard to explain because it's nothing's ever really. Happened. This is how captivating he is as a speaker. People believe him. He gets results. That's our man. While simultaneously doing the most psycho thing that any human being has ever done uh, uh, before, which we now we had to create a whole word for it. Like, there's not been more than one Holocaust. There's been the Holocaust. They're like, how do you explain this thing that happened with Hitler? And it's the Holocaust. And I just learned this here recently, um, uh, taking my class on Hitler. 
So the term the Holocaust didn't even come out until around 1960. Like 15 years after the war ends, they're like, hey, we can't just say he murdered people. Like this is a different level of murdering. What are we going to call that? And they uh, have, histo like historians have agreed, we just refer to it as the Holocaust for that specific uh, situation. So here's what happens. Uh, it's, it's unique. It wasn't like Hitler's in charge. He's like, murder them all. It's, it's a little different than that. Keep in mind, Hitler has no emotion. He's a sociopath. So emotions don't affect him uh, uh, like other people would. This is the only possible way that, that this works out. So his logic and the way he views things is a little different. He wants power. All right. He understands the way to get power is to have the people on your side. He knew that from the beginning. Come to power, I mean, he promised them everything when he, become, when he became the chancellor and then as president. And then he fulfills as many prof, uh, promises as he can. It's a shell game a lot, so he makes it look better than it really is. But just like all the other people, they're like, oh, we have a Jewish problem in Germany. So Jewish people, historically at this time, and this is what we don't realize today. So the turn to discriminate against Jewish people is called anti-Semitism. Anti-Jewish people, all right? Uh... So, historically, this has been going on in Europe for a long time. It was not unique in Europe. Germany was no more hateful towards Jewish people than anywhere else was because everybody was hateful towards Jewish people. Uh, and here's the dumb reason why. Historically and religiously, uh, since Eng uh, Europe is mainly Christian, and there's a very small percentage of Jewish people left in Europe they blamed, they, the Christians, blamed the Jewish people for killing Jesus. This was like 2,000 years before. So there's this like uh, ongoing like beef between Christians and Jewish people passively. Um, so, I mean, there, you, nobody's really getting beat to death in the streets or anything, but there was like, oh, I don't want you living in this neighborhood type of, you know, just discrimination that was common throughout Europe. Jewish people were historically in Europe looked down on. It was a very small group of people and it was just a thing that happened. Today it is extremely uncool in anti-Semitism. Nobody, everybody's like, man, you can't just talk junk about Jewish people. And the reason that comes out is the Holocaust, because you realize what happens when it's completely acceptable just to openly discriminate against a, gr a group of people. So when like Hitler's running for office, all right, and the Nazi party is, they talk a lot of junk about Jewish people. Well, so did most of the other political parties and the people that were running for political uh, office. There were like 10 political parties in Germany at the time. Only two of them allowed Jewish people even in their political party. It's also important to point out, Germany has a very small, very small Jewish population. Very small. Compared to other countries, extremely small. So, when Hitler runs for uh, uh, for office, he talks junk about Jewish people. This was a common thing to do. Uh, it was in the Great Depression. Just so happens the banks had, like most countries, had collapsed during the Great Depression in Germany. Of, like, the five major banks that collapsed in Germany, pure coincidence, three of those five banks were owned by Jewish people. So Hitler decided, hey, here's how I'm going to gain support, is I'm going to find a common enemy. While Germany is struggling, find a common enemy, and he picks out the Jewish people. It could have been anybody, all right? But he realizes that, that that's low-hanging fruit. Let's pick on Jewish people. And he's like, Jewish people are the reason for the Great Depression. If I come in, I'm going to get rid of the Jewish people, and then our economy is going to be great. And so he just says stuff so that he can be, uh, 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 you, you know, more popular. He just says whatever he wants to. Well, he ends up winning the election, all right? So Hitler realizes he's got to, you know, come through on a lot of his promises. Well, he promised that he was going to get rid of the Jewish people in Germany. So Hitler comes out. Uh, and he, he's the chancellor. He, he ends up being the president combined together. He becomes the, the dictator of uh, Nazi Germany. He says, all right, Jewish people leave. All right. Well, the Jewish people, they're used to being discriminated against. This probably isn't even the first time that a leader has told them to leave their country. They're like, nah, man. Like uh, they make up about 2% of the population in Germany. Like it's a very small percentage. They're like, nah, we're not. We're not going to leave. We'll just weather this storm. This dude, this crazy dude, he'll be out eventually and it'll go back to normal. Uh, as normal as it, it typically is for uh, Jewish people. Well, uh, what ends up happening uh, is Hitler, when he decides he's going to do something, he's going to do it. So once he said he's going to get rid of the Jewish people, he's like, all right, they ain't leaving. I'm going to make them leave. So 
uh, on November 9th and 10th, I believe 1935, uh, there is a date called, uh, it's called Night of Broken Glass. It's like midnight, so it's like the night time and morning, night of November 9th, morning of November 10th, that he sends all of his, so it's like his SS and his brown shirts. Now, he knows he's breaking the law here, so they have to dress in plain clothes. Like, it's not even as this, like, big open thing, so it's still kind of sneaky. So all of his, his, like, personal army goes out dressed in plain clothes, so they're just normal people. Because had he done it officially, this would have been unpopular enough that there would have been backlash. Goes out to all Jewish businesses and just trashes them. Burns people's uh, uh, businesses, destroys synagogues and Jewish churches. Uh, and basically, and there were a handful of Jewish people that were killed. People trying to defend their property were killed, but it wasn't a mass murder of Jewish people. It was called Kristallnacht, and it was just terrorism on Jewish people to let them know, we ain't playing, you're not welcome here. So the next morning, the Jewish people were like, Okay, he, he's like, for real, we out, all right? So all the Jewish people turn around and want to leave. Now, here's the problem. They're Jewish. You're like, yeah, we've been talking about that. Everybody in Europe is in the Great Depression, all the other countries. Where are the Jewish people going to go? They don't have a home country. There is no country on earth at the time that is predominantly Jewish. There is nowhere that is sympathetic or likes Jewish people in general. Uh, not to mention during the Great Depression where every country is like really struggling. Guess what other countries don't want? Immigrants. Much less Jewish immigrants. So Jewish people after Crystal Knock are like, yeah, you're right. We need to go. And then they can't and they can't leave. And they're like, that's when a panic starts. They're like, wait a minute. I can't legally leave my country? Like, that's ridiculous. Hitler also feels this way. He's like, oh my gosh, like, come on, this is ridiculous. So Hitler's already, like, moved on, creating an Autobahn, doing other stuff for the economy. But he can't just, like, ignore the Jewish people as he's already promised to get rid of them. That's how he thinks. He's like, fine, what are we going to do? So, uh, I'm, I'm jumping ahead uh, uh, a here. Don't, don't worry about the genocide yet. That is the last thing that happens here. So, what Hitler does is he first goes to ghettos. Uh, ghettos, uh, what he does is he walls off sections of the city, all right? Uh, and he's going to put the Jewish people in these sections of the city. They can just survive on their own, like whatever, like figure it out. Who cares? We'll just chuck some bread over the wall. They'll take care of themselves. We just get them out, out, out of the, the public sector. Here's where all the problems really start compounding for Hitler. Every country he takes over, as we talked about yesterday, uh, or the other day, Austria, uh, Czechoslovakia, Poland, guess what they have tons of in their country? Tons of Jewish people, which are now inside Germany. So while he sectioned off these walls of cities for the small percentage of Germans that were in Germany, like in these other countries, they have upwards of 10 to 12% of their population is uh, uh, Jewish that he has now taken over. So they tried to take all those people and put them in the same packed in little ghettos they had, they had sectioned off for the 2% of the German population. It's just not going to happen. The war is raging now. It, this is starting to become expensive. So instead of Hitler just being like, all right, you know what? I'll deal with this after the war and, and move on. Or, hey, let's not be a psychopath and treating people differently because I'm a racist jerk. Uh, what he ends up doing is he doubles down on it. He's like, fine. We're going to create these things called concentration camps, all right? So now the concentration camps, and the, like Auschwitz and, and all these horrific concentration camps, they ain't made in Berlin. So he's loved in Germany. Keep this in mind. The concentration camps aren't typically in Germany. They're out in the high-populated Jewish area, all right? Places like Poland, places like Austria, places that are not in original Germany with all his supporters. So what Hitler does is he creates these concentration camps and ships these uh, Jewish people out there. The idea of a concentration camp is it's completely self-sufficient. They go out there, they grow their own food, they survive on their own, and it's like a maximum security prison where they take care of themselves. It does not work out that way. Uh, they can't grow the food because a lot of places they build the concentration camps that don't have enough fertile soil or the prisoners the Jewish people don't have uh, uh, any skill set to be able to grow food. They're not given any supplies. They're not given any tools. Uh, they're basically sent out there to slowly starve to death. And the more places Hitler takes over, the more Jewish people he has in his population, the more he sends out to these concentration camps. It, it's it's a so when they start starving to death, who cares? It frees up space for somebody else. Like the the lack of emotion already in, in the entire situation is just 
absolutely uh, horrific. So the concentration camps, also, also called labor camps, uh, that uh, they they're just pumping uh, Jewish people in there, and also any prisoners they get, anybody else they don't like, they just send them to concentration camps. All right, uh, it gets really bad, and it's really expensive. You know how many trains you have to use to move that many people over there? This takes away from the war effort. Uh, so this is it's a huge undertaking for millions and millions of people in the middle of a war when you're fighting everybody, and it's like super intense. Now it's like 1940, 1941. Uh, so, uh, as the war drags on, and it gets into late nineteen uh, the mid nineteen forties, uh, there's just not enough money. There's not enough money to keep the concentration camps uh, going. Is basically either you got to close them, figure something out. There's too many soldiers that are running the concentration camps. We need them on the front lines. So Hitler, at the very end, it's, it's out of spite because he's starting to realize the war ain't going well, uh, and he also there is there is this, this mentality of him that if he can just kill everybody right now. Nobody will ever find out about this. Nobody will ever believe them if they're all dead. So he is like, so my image in history may not be tarnished, even when he's thinking ahead that he he might not make it out. So he gives the final order. It's called the final solution. Now, this is where we talk about like where, where is this tied to? Like, there's no paper trail that connects Hitler to this, but it all happens at the all the concentration camps at once. He clear. We have a pretty good idea of the meeting where it took place at the time period that it did. Uh, because he's going to say it in person. He's not going to let anybody write this down. He says, kill them all. Anybody in the concentration camps, kill them all. So at the very end of the war, it's called the final solution. And he just slaughters everybody that's in the concentration camp. There are so many people in the concentration camps uh, and they're using gas. The, they really had a problem when they were just having their soldiers go shoot the people in the concentration camps. Their big problem was the soldiers, after you kill about 100 people, they're broken. Like, they can't function. They're, the PTSD these soldiers have is just overwhelming, and, and they break down. So you're losing soldiers by having them do that. So they had to come up with an easier way of killing all the people in the, in the concentration camps. It's just, it's absolutely just disgusting, the depravity that human nature can, can take you. So they come up with the gas chambers. There's so many people in these concentration camps that they cannot effectively execute them all before the war ends and the concentration camps are liberated. Uh, nobody believed that this was happening because it's so ridiculous. If this made it out, they're like, eh, Hitler, why would, like, that's so counterintuitive. Why would he even try to do that? Uh, he does. Uh, he does try to do it, and, and he's very effective. Kills 13 million people doing this. At the end of the war, they're like, holy bejesus, did not expect this to happen. And we're going, we'll, we'll talk about it at the end of the unit. The people who snap the, the the people that are the most furious about this is the German population, and they're mad at themselves. At the end of the war, the rest of the world's like Germany. What are you letting you do? And they're like, well, what are you talking about? They're like, you see what's happening? Like <laughs> nothing bad. Oh, like Germany at the end of World War Two. It's they're not. It's not a saving face thing. It is the disgust they have at themselves for being completely hoodwinked by this Hitler guy and letting this happen. They the the guilt in Germany to this day over allowing this to happen because they understand they're a democracy. They let this guy go to power. They followed him and loved him. They had no idea that this was happening until after uh, they were dead. Could they have found out? Maybe, but keep in mind the concentration camps are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles away from any major German political center. So all you knew is just Jewish people were getting taken away, you know, to a farm upstate. Uh, no idea what was happening to them. Uh, and we're going to talk about at the end of this unit, the fallout up to present day that we have learned from the Holocaust and how these things happen. So, uh, uh, pictures of the Holocaust. These are people getting uh, shuttled into the, the ghettos. Uh, so I, I, I want to point out, so there's some pictures here. Like these are some liber at the very end of World War II. Uh, these are some uh, uh, guys that were liberated that were like starving to death in the Holocaust. There is no shortage of pictures of the Holocaust, but it's so disturbing that there's no point in, in me showing it to you uh, because the depths of human depravity is worse than any awful horror movie or anything that they can make. So uh, uh, there is just tons of the most heart-wrenching and soul-sucking pictures of what humans can do to other humans on the internet that I'm not showing it to you because I'm just here to give you the ideas over how humans can do this to other people. Uh, e e even for me, I can't, I can't go through and look at the pictures because it's just, it's, 
it's absolutely shocking. It makes it too real that humans can do this to other humans. Uh, if you ever read the book Night, I think you read it as a junior. Uh, the guy that wrote the book Night is in this picture. I believe it's this guy. I think it's him. It's one of them. It's an easy one to if you Google it. Who wrote the book Night uh, about being in a concentration camp that survived and wrote a book about it? Uh, it's one of these guys. I think it's him. I think I think it's this guy uh, here. Uh, I can't ever remember because I get confused. All right. So. With the Holocaust going on, and the reason you can just talk about it right there in its own little uh, unique situation is it doesn't affect the outcome of the war because nobody knew, believed it was happening. It does affect policy after the war once we realize it had happened and that we had ignored it because there's no way humans could be that psycho. Uh, so, But during the war, nobody knows about it, so it doesn't affect any policies or, or what we're supposed to do because nobody knew it was happening and if there were any rumors of it it was just so ridiculous that it wouldn't make any sense that nobody took it seriously all right the axis powers so hitler again psychopath not dumb all right so hitler uh hitler wants to team up with japan so let me show this is a, uh, a picture it's going to be the tripartite pact so uh, Hitler is a big fan of Mussolini. It's kind of weird. So Hitler teams up with Mussolini, loves Mussolini, thinks Mu Mussolini is absolutely fantastic and wonderful because Mussolini has convinced everybody he's done all these great things in his country. Hitler believes him that he has done all these great things in his country. Uh, uh, Mussolini clearly has not done all these great things in his country, but uh, 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 Hitler believes he has. So Hitler implements a lot of the same policies that Mussolini claims he has implemented in Italy, but Hitler actually does them in Germany and they're really effective. So it kind of makes you wonder why didn't Mussolini actually do the stuff he claimed he did? But I guess, you know, it's, it's one of those things like, hey, if, you know, if I have you guys do an assignment and you barely do it and you get a hundred on it, what's the incentive to, uh do more. And I guess that's how Mussolini is. If I can do like nothing and everybody loves me, what's the point of actually doing things? Note, you actually have to do things in order to get a hundred. All right. So don't, don't get squirrely on that. All right. So, uh, all right. So here you got, you got Hitler. Uh, you got Hideki Tojo. We're getting ready to talk about this in a second. Uh, and Mussolini, is he here? I'm trying to think if Mussolini was actually here when this happened. He may not have been. Anyway, uh, so Hitler has already teamed up with Italy, all right? He thinks, uh, Hitler views Italy as like a one-two punch. Italy is basically like, yeah, I'm teaming up with this guy. I don't want him to like... <laughs> mess with us so italy's like hitler's biggest cheerleader like yay good job hitler uh and so mussolini uh teams up with hitler real early on hitler then turns around and teams up with japan japan opposite side of the world like literally the opposite side of the world on the other side of the middle east on the other side of asia there's japan literally opposite side of the world from uh germany so japan has become an industrial uh, uh military powerhouse japan's main goal eventually is going to be to take over asia which is 60 percent of the world's population so hitler uh has already teamed up with italy he's going to team up with japan now that seems odd. Like, why in the world would Hitler team up with Japan? There's no benefit for Hitler. Here's why. America. So, America, while all this is taking place, we're like, staying out of it. Hitler knows America wants to stay out of this war. Hitler is going to do everything he can to keep America out of the war. So, Hitler realizes the dumbest thing you can do is, like, attack a country and expect them to, like, not attack you back. So, Hitler's not going to do anything aggressive to America. Uh, he continuously talks to it. He's very concerned with if America is going to, like, get involved or anything. But we're like, nah, we out. So, Hitler, uh, he's going to team up with Japan to keep America out of the war. At this point in history, all right, when he teams up with them in the late 1930s, that no country in the history of the world has ever fought a war on two fronts at the same time and won. So if America goes to war here against Germany, they also have to fight Japan, which is on the opposite side of America, and, try, and having to split our military in half, it appears at this time would be complete, there's 0% chance that you can win. 
So Hitler goes ahead and teams up with Japan so that if America starts thinking about getting involved in this war, they will realize you can't fight one without fighting the other. And so therefore, it's impossible to win. So you absolutely, for no possible reason, should try to fight this war. So that's why Hitler teams up with Japan. Spoiler alert. Japan's going to get mad at America and attack us at Pearl Harbor and bring us right into this war. So the entire purpose that Hitler got involved with Japan was to keep America out of the war actually completely backfires on him because it literally ends up being what brings America into the war against him. And they never mentioned, like in the whole class I took, I took on uh, Hitler, they never, it's never mentioned how Hitler felt towards Japan about this. Like it always frustrates me. Like I want to see him throw something or, or a report of it. And he just never like, he's like, all right, America's in, let's do it. Uh, but we'll, we'll get there. Uh, uh, not today. All right, so this is a video clip. So there's a handful of things going on here. America, we're starting to be prepared. We're going to start creating a big navy. So FDR realizes we don't want to get involved in the war, but just in case, we start building a big navy. Create something big, shiny, goes boom. Guess what? You eventually are going to want to use it. Uh, they're going to talk about that. They're going to talk about uh, our beef with Japan. So we start having beef with Japan because we don't like what they're doing in Asia, messing up our trade routes by like taking over countries. So we start being squirrely with Japan and Japan starts being salty with us. Uh, and then when they attack us, we're like, we had no idea they were mad. They clearly let us know they were mad because we were doing stuff to them. But it talks about our beef with Japan, our buildup of the Navy, and then it's the tripartite pact with Hitler uh, uh, meeting up with the leader of Japan, a guy named Hideki Tojo. And play. As Hitler expands his domination of Western Europe, Congress authorizes $4 billion to build a two-ocean navy, one to protect the Atlantic seaboard, the other to deter the increasingly aggressive empire of Japan in the Pacific. While as Hitler expands his domination of Western Europe, Congress authorizes $4 billion to build a two-ocean navy, one to protect the Atlantic seaboard, the other to deter the increasingly aggressive empire of Japan in the Pacific. While FDR insists America has no intention of entering the European war, it is clear he will not allow the country to be unprotected. The growing threat of Japan forces FDR to take action. On August 1st, all Japanese assets are frozen. Japanese-American trade comes to a halt. Their leaders accuse the U.S. of economic strangulation. To put America on some sort of war footing, President Roosevelt signs the first peacetime draft. General Douglas MacArthur, commander of the U.S. Army... See if I can pause this up. This is important. Argued for years. All right, so... Douglas MacArthur, we're going to talk a lot about him in World War II. He ends up being a huge player. He's arguing about how underfunded the military is. Great Depression. They don't have any money. So MacArthur and FDR had beef with each other because F obviously the military always wants like tons and tons of money. Uh, so MacArthur's like, we're underfunded. And FDR's like, it'll be fine. It ended up kind of being a struggle. On, but this example here is awesome. They don't, so when they do their, their exercises trying to, you know, get, uh, uh, prepared. They don't have enough like tanks to actually do tank maneuvers. So they got a big old truck here and it says tank on the side. So everybody has to acknowledge it's like a tank, even though they don't have enough tanks to actually do their, their training exercises uh, to kind of go to show uh, what MacArthur's talking about, how underfunded they are. Well, hopefully I can hit play and it doesn't start over. That's a military, is it? Oh, really? That's what we're going to do now? Why is that sound doing that? Don't be weird. Cute. <sighs> so this is a thing. Hooray technology. Actually, you, you know what that is? Let me pause this real quick. That is because blah, blah, blah. I have a battery dead on something here. I'm going to pause it and it's going to be like instantaneously. All right. So I had to change the batteries in. Did it seem instantaneous? All right. Please work. I said, please work. It's an economic and military alliance with Axis powers Italy and Germany, called the Triparte Pact. All that work for like five more seconds. All right. Uh, so the Tripartite Pact, tri means three. It's between Mussolini, 
Hideki Tojo, who we're going to talk about that. Uh, uh, not right now, but we're going to talk about that. And then you got uh, um, Mussolini, Mussolini, Hideki Tojo, and Hitler, the Tripartite Pact. All right. So here's the next thing that's going to happen. Uh, the Battle of Britain is still taking place, getting absolutely destroyed. England is getting bombed and bombed and bombed. Who are they begging for help from? America. All right. So it is not looking good at all. It just absolutely looks absolutely awful uh, for England and Europe. They're asking for help from America. We're backing out of it, saying we're not going to have anything to do with it. Uh, so 100% of the American population is against it, except FDR. So FDR is looking around. He's like, hey, guys, like, he views it, and this is the analogy he'll eventually use. If your neighbor's house is on fire, and, like, if you're right next to each other, if your houses are on fire, uh, if your neighbor's house is on fire, uh, you're going to loan them your garden hose, all right, to help put out the fire. Is it your problem? No, sure it's not. But you want to help put out that fire because if you don't, you know what's going to eventually happen? That fire is going to spread to you. So he's like, hey, we should probably help out England, but we have the neutrality acts. We're not allowed to help out England. So here's what happens, all right? So FDR needs to help out England. And here's why. If we get involved in this war, and FDR thinks it's inevitable that we're going to get involved in this war, when we get involved in this war, what's going to happen is we need a place to set up shop. The last place available in, in, in Europe where we can set up shop is England. If England falls, that means every time we have to have a battle, we have to go all the way across the Atlantic. This is the 1940s. That's not going to be a thing that can be done. So we, FDR knows this, America needs England to survive if we get involved in this war. FDR thinks it's inevitable. So he needs to help out England. However, you can't give any country that's at war weapons. So here's what FDR says. He says, hey, England, y'all want some help? And they're like, yes, 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 yes. It's like, would y'all like some weapons? They're like, absolutely, give us weapons. We're like, no, 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 no. Can't give you any weapons. That's against the law, all right? And like the American people are looking at FDR. They're like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Everybody loves FDR. But this is the first time they're like, wait a minute. What, what are you, what's happening? And he's like, so I can't give y'all weapons because that's illegal. Um, but I'll tell you what. Bring some uh, boats over here, some empty boats, and we'll sell you all the weapons that you want because we're not giving them to you. England's like, we, we don't have any money. Like, we, we are literally out of money. Like, we can't buy any weapons from you. And FDR's like, don't make me tell you again. Get your boat, bring it over here, and get your money. Get your wallet and bring it over here. So England comes over here. We load every boat with millions of dollars of weapons. Then we charge them 20 bucks. And we send them on back on their way. The entire America looks at FDR and says, what, what are you doing? He's like, sold them weapons. Now, granted, he sold them millions of dollars for like 20 bucks, like next to nothing. Those are exaggerated figures. Uh, but they, they basically are buying this for next to nothing. And just so technically, they are buying it from us. So England's getting more weapons, and they're actually able to last longer against Germany. Well, this works for a little bit, and it's called the cash and carry policy. Then... England 100% runs out of money, just completely runs out of money. When England runs out of money, uh, FDR is like, oh, dang, what am I going to do? Because he has to keep giving them weapons. It's the only way they're surviving. Uh, and he's like, uh, okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to switch from the cash and carry policy since you're out of money. And we're going to go to this thing called the, um, the Land Lease Act. So we're going to just loan you weapons. We're not giving them to you because that would be illegal. We're going to let you borrow them, all right? The, uh, letting people borrow weapons is like borrowing a piece of chewing gum. This is not a thing that, that comes back. Uh, so the American people are pretty perturbed about this because they realize FDR is putting us on a war footing. Not only that, we have clearly sided with England here. We're still salty about World War I. Like, they wouldn't listen to the 14 points. So, But he is clearly putting us on a path kind of slowly meandering towards this war, which the American people want to stay out of. But the Lend-Lease Act is where we are loaning weapons to England. They have to pay us back later with them or, or you know, give them back to us when they're done. We don't really want them back. The Lend-Lease Act is very, very important because it's what allows England to survive long enough 
for when America does get involved in this war. All right. Uh, so there's a little video clip. This is going to be about the Lend-Lease Act. And that's Winston Churchill. This is the leader of England at the time. Play. If thanks. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. But bravery alone could not win the war. Britain was crippled with no more resources to build the planes and ships needed to withstand Germany's next attacks. Winston Churchill turned to America and FDR for help. In 1940, Franklin Roosevelt was re-elected to a third term as president, the only American president ever to serve more than two terms. Roosevelt would not commit troops to the overseas battlefield, but he vowed to help the British in their life-or-death struggle against Hitler's regime. I ask our most useful and immediate role is to act as an arsenal for them as well as for ourselves. With FDR's urging, Congress passed the Loan on Lease Plan, which allowed him to lend or lease arms and other supplies to any country whose defense was vital to the United States. Not all Americans were united in their support of the president, however. Charles Lindbergh, the first man to fly solo across the Atlantic in 1927, was a staunch opponent of America's involvement in the war. We cannot allow the natural passions and prejudices of other peoples to lead our country to destruction. Despite opposition from Lindbergh and others, the Len gave thanks. Never in the field of human conflict, but so much... So, this is a cartoon right here. This is my boy Logan. Logan, wave. All right, yeah. So, Logan, I can't stop it in the middle of a video. So, uh, this is my boy. He's upset because his Xbox controller just died. And so then he can't play his game. So, give me one second. He's going to disappear here. All, all right, the boy has been vanquished. He got more batteries for his Xbox. Been doing work with him all morning. Anyway, all right. Uh, so the last thing that's very important here is this thing called the Atlantic Charter. All right. So the Atlantic Charter is Winston Churchill is very very happy that uh, America wants to get involved and get and give him stuff. Winston Churchill desperately needs America to commit troops to this situation. So. Winston Churchill comes over and meets with FDR on a boat off of the coast of, of, uh, of Canada, all right? And when they sit here, they're going to meet, and this is called the Atlantic Charter, all right? It's very important because a couple things happen here. At this Atlantic Charter, uh, they, they're, they're both on the ship here. I got a picture of it. This is uh, Winston Churchill uh, sitting here next to FDR. Notice they're both sitting down. All pictures of FDR are always taken when everybody's sitting down. Do you know why that is? It's because FDR is in a wheelchair, all right? And out of sign of respect for him, everybody sits in chairs. Even when, spoiler alert, st on the first picture ever of Stalin sitting down is going to be uh, with FDR. Uh, so Winston Churchill looks at FDR and says, I need you to commit troops right now. FDR says a couple things here that's very important. This is called a Declaration of the United Nations. It's a little confusing because there's a group that comes out after World War II called the United Nations. The fact those are the same terms is pure coincidence. Uh, FDR says, we are like a United Nations, meaning America and England, BFFs, from this point, from this meeting right here to present day, America and England are BFFs. They're like our only friend. Uh, you probably all have a really dumb friend who does really dumb stuff and you have to go support them even though you know what they did is dumb. If you don't have a really dumb friend that you have to support all the time when they do dumb stuff, you're the dumb friend. All right? So we all have one of those people. All right? Uh, so... Uh, <laughs> We're England. Uh, whenever we do weird stuff, England always supports us from this point on. FDR tells uh, Winston Churchill, hey, I support you, man. Everything is fantastic. Everything is great. Uh, I want to do everything in my power to help you out. However, however, I can't ask the American people right now for a declaration of war. But I'll do everything in my power to make sure one happens. That's kind of crazy that he says that because, shockingly, very soon after this, we're attacked by Pearl Harbor. Uh, or attacked by Japan at Pearl Harbor. Uh, 
But so at the Atlantic Charter, we basically say we're on your side. Germany's a bad guy. We know that. We can't get involved right now, but I want to do everything in my power to make sure that we do get involved. Uh, so it's kind of odd that he says that right for Pearl Harbor, but it's Japan. I, I'm not starting a conspiracy theory here. Japan 100% attacked us at, at Pearl Harbor. Uh, but there is a, a, a train of thought now as we get further away from it at the time that maybe we knew that was going to happen. Uh, and that's what FDR was referencing, knowing that there's a chance there could be a conflict with Japan and we use that as an excuse to hop in and help them out. All right, that's as far as we're going to get today. Uh, see you.